Okay. Hello again, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about Renaissance and mannerism in 16th century Italy, which is also known as the uh, Cinque Cento. So if you want to know the Italian word for the period we're talking about, that's what it is. Okay. So this um, part of this time is also known as the High Renaissance. We're also going to get a little bit into the Late Renaissance. 16th century Italy, um, it's not like really dominated by one particular style. This is a time when regionalism becomes pretty prominent. So we start seeing the development of different styles and trends in um, painting, sculpture, and architecture in different areas of Italy. So we've seen from the lecture so far some of the differences between the Renaissance in Northern Europe and in Italy, but Italy becomes sort of less unified in style at this time. There's a lot of um, masters of different styles and a lot of different developments. Um, so we especially see this in central Italy, so uh, Florence and Rome. Okay, let's talk about our first guy. Another uh, artist of Ninja Turtle fame, who I'm sure most of you have heard of. If you haven't, that is okay. Uh, Leon Leonardo da Vinci. So Leonardo da Vinci is one of the most famous artists of all time, probably. Um, if you're familiar with one of his pieces, it's probably the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is his most famous. Um, his Last Supper is very famous as well. Uh, one of you is assigned to write about the Mona Lisa on our discussion, so we'll hear more about that from whichever one of you is writing about it. Um, the piece I want to talk to you about today is called The Madonna of the Rocks. So first let's talk a little bit about Leonardo and kind of get to know him. Um, he's born in the small town of Vinci, hence his last name, Da Vinci, meaning of or from Vinci. Uh, Vinci is very near Florence. Um, it's kind of, it's not exactly a suburb, everything's kind of smaller than, but it's like, it's very close to Florence. It's almost part of Florence. So he's from that region. He's from Tuscany. Um, he trained in the studio of uh, Andrea del uh, Verrocchio, who is another famous artist from this time period. We haven't looked at his stuff specifically, but he's he's quite famous of the time. Um, and Leonardo is the guy who we kind of think of as the quintessential Renaissance man. He's literally called the Renaissance man by people. And what that means is, as we've talked about in the Renaissance, there's this interest in humanism. So there's this interest in um, the exceptionalness of the individual and this interest in gaining more knowledge and education in a lot of areas. So art was only one of Leonardo's interests. He's also um, very interested in a lot of subjects. He has numerous notebooks which survive, so we actually know quite a lot about him and about what he thought and about his studies. Um, so he writes about botany, geography, geology, zoology, anatomy, engineering, mechanics, particularly military engineering and mechanics. So he's a great thinker. He's very, very smart. He has a very unique handwriting. He would often write his notebooks backwards. He just had one of those kind of exceptional brains where he knew how to do lots of things. He understood a lot of things and he thought about a lot of different things. And he was a very wonderful artist. So he's a genius. So we're going to talk about him. Okay. He also believed, um, and he's recorded in saying in some of his notebooks, that his scientific interests and studies made him a better painter, which is kind of a new idea for the time. This idea of looking directly to anatomy and to the natural human form for inspiration. So um, from his uh, treatise on painting, which he wrote, here's what he says about painting. Uh, painting is a matter of greater mental analysis, of greater skill, and more marvelous than sculpture, since necessity compels the mind of a painter to transform itself into the very mind of nature, to become an interpreter between nature and art. So that's kind of like, throwing down a little bit against the sculptors of the time. He's saying that painting is sort of the supreme art form and the supreme realm of thought, which is pretty interesting, and it did not go unchallenged. A little later we'll talk about what Michelangelo, another famous artist from the period who you've probably heard of, thought about that, because Michelangelo is of the mind that sculpture is the preeminent dominant um, intellectual form. So we'll get into that a little later. They had a little, like, kind of back and forth about it. Okay. So it's interesting because um, both Leonardo and Michelangelo um, both were painters and sculptors of, of high re renown. They were also both engineers. They were both interested in architecture. So we have some kind of friendly rivalry between these, these dominant geniuses of the time. All right, so let's look at this painting. This is the Madonna of the Rocks. Um, and 
it's it's a pretty wonderful painting. He paints it after he moves to Milan. This is where he makes most of his masterpieces. So he's from the area of Florence, but he moves to Milan. Um, in the Madonna of the Rocks, we have Mary, obviously, the Virgin Mary in the center. We have uh, John the Baptist, we have the Christ child, and then we have an angel. Um, so one of the things that I want to look at is the way Leonardo interprets um, composition is different from anyone else at the time, and he kind of develops this kind of composition as the standard for these kind of portraits. So you can see if you look at the figures, they form a kind of triangle. It's sort of a trapezoid, but for our purposes, we're going to call it a triangular composition because that's how we think of it as uh, when we look at art history. So looking at the figures and what they're doing with their hands and how their faces are pointed is pretty key. So they point, they pray, they gesture in ways that make your eye move around the painting. And they create this movement, but that also creates the balance in the form of the composition. So the angel points to John the Baptist, but looks at the viewer to draw the viewer in, right? John kind of makes a praying gesture towards the Christ child. Christ blesses John in return, so it moves your eye back and forth between them. Mary rests her right hand on John and reaches her left hand towards her son, towards the Christ child. So this, so Mary sort of further reinforces the movement that's already happening between all the figures. She's the grounding form and focal point of all the action in this painting. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, the mood in the painting is another thing that's a signature of Leonardo. So um, we talked last time a little bit about the difference between tempera and oil paint and how oil paint created new opportunities for artists. Leonardo is one of the artists who capitalized on the different properties of oil. So the mood he creates is kind of tender. We have this color that's very subtle, very nuanced. Um, there's sort of a hazy atmosphere. He uses two different techniques to create this. One is called chiaroscuro. We associate this also with Caravaggio, a Baroque painter we'll talk about later. That's the idea of the play of light and dark, not just to show um, perspective and to show that things are three-dimensional, but also to create mood, so more than just perspective. The other technique, and this is a technique, technique he's credited with inventing, is called sfumato. So that's S-F-U-M-A-T-O. And that's the smoky, misty kind of quality. That's something that was not achievable with tempera. Um, it's something that oil paint allowed to be developed by artists and particularly by Leonardo. Okay, so the two breakthroughs in this painting are the unified composition of the figures and our triangle composition and the atmospheric setting. And as I said, oil paint is really instrumental into the, these developments. Um, using oil in a very different way here than we saw in the Northern European painters. Remember when we were talking about Van der Weyden and Van Eyck, they're masters of oil paint as well, but as I pointed out then, everything even way in the background is very sharp and focused, and there's a lot of attention to encyclopedic detail. So very minute, tiny details. Everything's very crisp and sharp. We have very deep, rich colors. So that's one way to use oil, but the way Leonardo does it has this other kind of touch that makes the figure's skin kind of glow, and we have this misty kind of atmosphere. So it's a very different use. Um, and he, he talks about this a little bit. So from one of his notebooks, Leonardo uh, says that the two main goals of a painter should be to paint man and the intention of his soul. The former is easy, the latter hard, for it must be expressed by gestures and the movement of the limbs. So not only is he thinking about mood in terms of color and this kind of glowy atmospheric presence, but the gentle way the hands and the limbs are laid out in this composition and in some of his others is also very intentional. So he's trying to, to show not just what people look like on the outside, but their character, their inner selves, their soul, which is a fairly new idea for this time. So it's not just representational, it's doing, um, it's, it's doing more, right? Okay, so he's a great painter, no doubt about that. Um, and we'll see from one of your peers who's writing about the Mona Lisa, uh, that he has many, uh, he has that work, but he has tons of other works worth um, investigating. So um, another thing, if you have the opportunity, check out his drawings, you can Google them. The drawings of Leonardo da Vinci are spectacular and are, are really worth seeing and pretty fantastic. Okay. Let's talk about another guy of Ninja Turtle fame, Raphael. But first, uh, let's talk about why, why we know who he is. Okay, so Pope Julius II succeeds Alexander VI, uh, 
The popes um, are very important patrons of the arts from their from the the beginning, but um, Pope Julius II is kind of the big patron. So when he takes over, he decides that he wants to make big changes to the design of St. Peter's Cathedral, which is the cathedral in uh, Vatican, the, the Vatican City. It's the seat of the Pope. He also decides that he wants to commission a lot of artwork. So he wants to have this legacy as being this great patron of the arts. So he commissions a lot of work. Um, his most famous commission is the um, ceiling of the Sistine Cham Chapel by Michelangelo, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But first he commissions Raphael to paint the papal apartments. So this is kind of the Pope, where the Pope lives at Vatican City, essentially. Um, okay, so let's see. We have uh, Raphael. So Raphael, is, his birth name is uh, Raffaello Santi, is his name, or Sanziano. Um, we know him as Raphael, just a one-name guy, like uh, like Cher, but of the art world. Um, and basically, you'll see you'll see more of his work uh, in our discussion. One of you is assigned to write about Raphael's Madonna of the Meadow. Um, whichever one of you is writing about that, make sure that you think about Leonardo's Madonna of the Rocks and kind of look at the similarities and dissimilarities in the composition there because Raphael takes a lot from Leonardo in terms of composition but he has a very different idea about color and line so it's pretty interesting. Okay so we're going to talk about this work which is called Philosophy. Um, it's also more commonly known as the School of Athens that's not actually the title but a lot of art historians have called it that so that sort of becomes part of its title but it's actually called Philosophy. Um, it was made between 1509 and 1511. It's a fresco. Um, we haven't talked a lot about fresco as a technique yet. If you've had Art History 1, you probably learned a lot about fresco. Uh, there's two kinds of fresco, fresco secco and fresco buono. This is fresco buono, which means you're painting on wet plaster, so the paint becomes part of the wall. Okay, so that is what this is. Um, <clears throat> Raphael was born in Urbino in 1483. <clears throat> he was only 37 when he died, so he, he didn't live as long as most of the masters of this time, but he was very prolific, meaning he made a lot of work. And one of the reasons that we have so much of his work is because of the patronage of Julius II <clears throat> and because he made these frescoes inside the papal uh, apartments. So specifically, Raphael, uh, decorates the Stanza della Signatura, which is essentially the library. It literally means the room of signatures. So this is the library of the papal offices, um, at the papal apartments. It's also where popes sign important documents. So that's, uh, that's quite an important space, and that is where this image exists. Um, this image is across from an, an image called uh, Theology. So within this room, he paints theology, law or justice, poetry, and philosophy, which were considered, considered the four main kinds of knowledge that a pope would need to be a good pope at this time, a good pope in the era of the Renaissance. Um, so the setting of philosophy is basically it's this meeting of all the great minds that are highly valued in uh, humanist philosophy so we see philosophers and scientists science is a branch of uh, basically philosophy at this time um, so these are people from the ancient world they're not contemporaries necessarily with um, Raphael or Pope Julius II um, so we see this big influence of humanism again uh, the architecture in this painting is clearly Roman. We have a barrel vault with coffered ceilings, which is one of the um, classical Roman techniques of architecture that was developed in their development with um, concrete. So if you have Art History 1, we talk about that quite a lot. Um, we also, if you see in the background, we have statues of Apollo and Athena. So these are deities of arts and wisdom. Um, the central two figures are Plato and Aristotle. You can see Plato holds his book, Timaeus, and points to heaven, which is, he, he says he drew inspiration for that book from the heavens. Um, Aristotle holds his book, uh, Nicomachean Ethics, and points down to the earth. So he's saying that his book is based um, on observations of reality of here, not a heavenly influence, but a, the influence of man and nature. Um, so... Some of the great minds portrayed in this were also portraits of Raphael's peers, so he kind of snuck in some sort of head nods to the geniuses of his time. For example, uh, Heraclitus 
is probably based on Michelangelo. Um, Raphael's self-portrait is also snuck in here. If you look in um, your right-hand corner, right where the arch starts to go up, you see an unbearded young man in a black hat. That is most likely Raphael. Uh, so that's just kind of a fun little interesting thing. He definitely took some cues on um, composition from Leonardo. He also bases a lot of things in Eu Euclidean geometry. Euclid is also portrayed in here. So um, we have an ellipsis shape that uh, is formed by the figures. Um, and basically the whole idea of this piece is that it harmonizes the Platonists and uh, the, re the Aristotelians, but it also hu harmonizes humanism and the ideas of Christianity, which is kind of um, exactly what Pope Julius II wanted and how he thought of himself as a ruler and as a pope. Okay, so now we are going to talk about another really famous guy from the side, from this time, another uh, Ninja Turtle namesake, Michelangelo. A lot of um, the American pronunciation is Michelangelo, um, that's technically not right, but it doesn't really matter. So if you want to call him Michelangelo, that's fine. It's Michelangelo. Okay, so um, he was a painter, he was an architect, he was a poet, he was an engineer, and he was a sculptor. Um, he's probably most famous for this, which is the, uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which is sort of funny and ironic because he really thought of himself as a sculptor. He did not think of himself as a painter, even though he's one of the most famous and recognizable painters of all time. So it's sort of interesting. Okay, so Michelangelo uh, Bonarotti is his, his last name. He was born in 1475 and he died in 1654. He's from Florence, like a lot of the, the famous guys from this time, but his most famous works were all commissioned by um, Julius II, the Pope, and his successor. So he did, he spent a lot of time in Rome. So Vatican City is within Rome, so he spent a lot of time up there, even though he's from Florence. Okay. He's kind of what we call, we think of uh, Michelangelo as an artist's artist. He's someone who, by all accounts of the time, was really highly esteemed by um, his peers. He's, he also was very charismatic and funny, so he was very well liked. All of the artists who kept notebooks and wrote at the time wrote about him. Vasari wrote a lot about him in his um, Lives of the Artists. Vasari is kind of credited as being the first art historian. He wrote a book called The Lives, and that's about all the artists in the Renaissance. Um, Okay, so he's generally described as awe-inspiring. He's considered the great genius of the time, along with Leonardo. Julius II insisted that Michelangelo must paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He didn't want to do it. He had been hired originally by Julius II to construct his tomb, which sounds sort of morbid, but a lot of popes have um, their tomb specially designed and commissioned by artists, so it makes sense. And while he's working on this, Julius II says, you know, my private chapel, the Sistine Chapel, where the uh, School of Cardinals meet to pick the next pope. It's a very important building. It's very plain. I would like for you to paint the ceiling. And Michelangelo is not into it. He does not want to do it, but he eventually gives in and says, all right, all right, all right, I'll do it. It's very difficult for him. He's not really familiar with um, the technique of fresco painting, so he has to redo the first section several times. Um, he has a lot of trouble because the ceiling is curved, so uh, perspective is very difficult to capture on a curved ceiling and thinking about people viewing it from the floor. He still manages to do this entire gigantic thing in four years, which is pretty incredible. Um, and it's considered a triumph of the time, basically. So it's, it's very well regarded, even though he was like worried about it and didn't really want to do it. Um, okay, there's over 300 figures painted on the ceiling, so that's a ton of work, obviously. Uh, the themes are the creation of man, the fall of man, and the redemption of humankind. Okay, the central pan panels are the fall of man and the creation of Adam, the creation of Adam being the most famous. So we're going to look a little closer at that. Here's the creation of Adam, which is in the very center of the ceiling. Uh, and then he also painted the Last Judgment fresco, which is on the wall above the altar. Um, okay, so the creation of Adam is a new interpretation of the story. He um, purposefully leaves the background blank, so it's like we're kind of in this void. God creates Adam and then touches him to spark him with life and bring him to life. And if you look at this uh, painting, you can see while God is pointing directly at Adam, Adam's finger dips down a little bit and points kind of under the corner of God. You see this woman's face holding a baby, that's the Virgin Mary and the Christ. So it's kind of 
pointing even Adam, the first man, is pointing forward to the redemption of man through Christ in the Christian Bible. So it's an interesting gesture. Um, he was very interested in um, drawing and the human body. Uh, he definitely draws with a sculptor's kind of mind. His bodies have some kind of mass to them, you can feel. Um, the Last Judgment is actually commissioned by Julius II's successor, Paul III. Julius II dies, Paul III su succeeds him, and also retains Michelangelo for another painting, which Michelangelo not thrilled about, but he does it anyway. So this is uh, the Last Judgment scene. Somewhere in here is um, Michelangelo's self-portrait. I forget exactly where it is. <clears throat> but basically he does the whole of the Sistine Chapel. So he does this large um, fresco on the wall above the altar, and he does the ceiling. So even though he doesn't consider himself a painter, he's a very accomplished and prolific painter. Let's talk about one of his sculptures, since that's what he considered himself to uh, kind of be, that, that was his preferred medium, basically. Okay, one of you is writing about Michelangelo's David, which is perhaps his most famous sculpture. His other famous sculpture is this one, the Pieta. Um, Pieta is a common motif in sculpture of this time and in the Baroque. It is um, the dead Christ being held by his mother, being held by Mary. So after the crucifixion, she's holding his body before he is um, deposed, before he's buried in the uh, behind the rock that rolls away and all that. Okay. So this is a really interesting sculpture. He's a great sculptor, of course. This is marble. And when you think about how hard marble is, his ability to transform it into this glowy human flesh and this beautiful, delicate, folded drapery is incredible. But when we look at his sculpture in comparison to, say, Bernini's sculpture, which we looked at earlier, of the ecstasy of St. Teresa, we see that the proportions in Michelangelo's sculpture are not um, quite accurate and that is on purpose. So this is leading into something we call mannerism, which follows the high Renaissance. So when you look at this, Mary is gigantic. She's huge. Look at how huge she is. She's this massive kind of person compared to the very delicate, frail body of the dead Christ. This is an adult man in his 30s. He should be um, proportionally much larger than he is shown here. The reason that Michelangelo does this is because he's more interested in the emotional content of the work. So he wants the Christ to look frail and small and limp, cradled in his mother's arms. And for Mary and Mary's love to be the substantive, more massive, centering part of this work. If you look at it in terms of composition, you see that the triangular composition is still present, even in a sculptural form. So he's taking notes from Leonardo too, even though they were a little bit of rivals at the time, kind of. So it's a very beautiful sculpture. It's very interesting. It's also in Vatican City. It's in St. Peter's, if you ever uh, visit. And it's it's a very interesting thing to see. Um, Michelangelo famously wrote in his journals, um, kind of in response to Leonardo saying painting is the greatest um, art form and greatest intellectual form, and he says that if Leonardo really thought painting was superior to sculpture, then he must not have been as knowledgeable as he claimed, and that his own, Michelangelo's serving maid, could have written better than Leonardo did. So they had a little bit of a kind of back and forth. Okay, let's talk about the two, uh, uh, excuse me, let's talk about one of the next great painters of the High Renaissance. Um, Let's see, this is Titian, whose uh, given name is uh, Tiziano Vicelli. We know him as Titian. A lot of these names kind of get shortened. Um, he is a master of oil painting. He's an incredible colorist. He's one of the first artists to pretty exclusively use canvas. He doesn't paint on wood very often. So he's kind of where we get the oil on linen canvas as the standard comes into play with Titian. Um, okay, so his work is, yet again, as I said in the beginning, there's a lot of different kinds of styles, different styles particularly regionally. So when you contrast this, the style of Michelangelo, the style of Raphael, the style of Leonardo, you can see that there's a little bit of everybody, kind of. So um, one of you is writing about his painting of Bacchus and Ariadne, so we'll, we'll hear a little more about another one of his works in the discussion thread. In 1538, Titian paints this masterpiece, 
Um, its title is given to it later. Venus of Urbino is not the original title. This is a thing that was done um, to kind of justify nudity in artwork at the time. A lot of times um, it would just be a painting of a beautiful woman in her bedchamber, but for people at the time it made it more palpable if this was a mythological subject. Okay, so thus we have Venus of Urbino, not just some lady in her bedroom being naked, right? Okay, so this kind of elevates it in the eye of the people at the time. Um, Titian actually based this painting on another painting by uh, uh, Giorgione. We don't look at that one, but it's a sort of, it's a similar kind of subject matter, but he changes it quite a lot in terms of composition. And it's Titian's painting that becomes kind of the compositional blueprint, the standard for, for painting uh, reclining nudes, which is a very popular and common motif in painting up well through Romanticism. So we'll talk about several other paintings this semester that are um, in a similar kind of layout. What I think is super interesting about Titian is the way he combines um, Michelangelo's kind of interest in curvature and line and drawing with this sort of atmospheric softness that Leonardo uses in his paint. But rather than having this cool sfumato kind of feeling that you get from Leonardo, he has this very warm color, the sort of soft focus, but very warm sort of flesh tones and color. Um, he's a Venetian painter. He's mostly painting in Venice, and you can see that a little in this palette. You have a lot of red and gold, which are sort of the colors of Venice. So he is a very interesting painter of his time and certainly one of the masters. This is another painting by Titian, um, and it's a lovely painting. He, um, the other thing he's really known for is portraiture. So he does a lot of portraiture at this time. This particular portrait I'm interested in talking to you about because of the subject of the portrait. Um, so in the Renaissance, there's some successful women artists. There's uh, Sophonisha Aguasola, um, who's a painter. There's Lavina Fontana, who's a painter. They have some success. Um, there's one uh, famous female sculptor, uh, Propizia de Rossi. She's the only woman that Vasari mentions in the lives of the artist. Um, so she was fairly successful. Not a lot of her work survives, but um, basically it was very hard to become commercially successful as a woman artist in the Renaissance. The women who were very influential and very successful in the Renaissance in the arts were patrons. So this woman, Isabella uh, d'Este, is an example of one of the most successful and one of the most influential patrons of the time. And not just influential, and successful as a woman patron, but as a woman or a man. She's one of the most influential and important patrons, period, in the Renaissance. Okay, uh, so she commissioned work from Leonardo, from Andrea Montana, from Titian, and she basically helped establish their careers. So I just wanna give a nod to her because she's kind of rad. This painting that she commissioned by Titian was actually done when she was in her 60s, but she asked him to make her look like she was in her 20s, so it's, it's kind of a funny, like, can you soft focus insta-filter this for me, but back in the Renaissance. Okay, um, I wanted to include um, uh, Parmigianino because he, in my I, mind, is kind of the quintessential example of mannerism. So in the high, after the high Renaissance, we kind of move into this movement called mannerism. Um, and basically, we see hints of this early, earlier, like Botticelli's sort of S-shaped, dislocated shoulder-looking women, uh, Michelangelo's distortions of anatomy and proportion to uh, create more emotional, expressive works. Uh, this is all kind of leading into the ideas behind um, mannerism. And in mannerism, basically, the emphasis is on elegance rather than realism or naturalism. So you look at this painting, it's very beautiful. It's the Madonna with the long neck. He certainly didn't title it that, but that's what we call it as art historians. Um, so you can see that she has some kind of interesting um, anatomy going on. He, uh, mannerism is kind of marked by elongated forms, sinuous delicate hands, but you look at those fingers, her hand is gigantic, um, and attenuated neck and arms. So this kind of extended, very sinuous, long, graceful sort of bodies that have no real relation to actual anatomy. This becomes kind of the beauty standard of the time in paintings. So we see a lot of paintings that um, certain, that kind of head in this direction away from naturalism. Okay, the last two people we're gonna talk about are the two masters of the late Renaissance, and they are Tintoretto and Veronese. So uh, 
Uh, Jacopo uh, Robusti is known as Tintoretto. He's from Venice. He's born in 1518. He was probably a student of Titian. If you look at the way he uses line and color and the sort of soft uh, kind of glowy flesh that's very like reminiscent of Titian, right, that we were just looking at. So we think he probably studied with Titian. Um, he's very interested in combining Michelangelo's lines with this kind of interesting soft focus color treatment and particularly the warm glowy flesh tones of Titian and he writes about that. Um, this is an illustration of the story of Leda and the Swan. It's a mythological story. So if you know anything about Zeus, um, the god Zeus, you know that he liked to cheat on his wife Hera a lot with mortals. So um, the way he did that was sometimes he would appear as someone or something else. When he decided to seduce Leda, he appears to her as a swan. I don't know why that's seductive, but that is the thing. So that is what this painting is of. What's interesting to me about this painting of by Tintoretto is he tries to kind of make the swan seem like it fits in. So instead of just a woman and a swan in her bedroom, there's a swan, but there's also a little dog. There's also this cat that looks a lot like my cat, Nimsy, so I like it. Looking at this duck, there's a parrot and an aviary in the background. So he's like, let's put some more animals in here to make it seem less weird that there's suddenly this swan um, in this naked lady's bedroom. So uh, that's what's happening in here. Tintoretto later in his life um, really leans into chiaroscuro as a technique. So we see these very glowy, bright highlights with these very dark shadows, and that becomes sort of his standard of painting later. Um, okay, his contemporary and in, in uh, the other kind of master of the late Renaissance in Venice is Veronese. So here is Veronese. He's born, um, his first name is Paolo, Paolo Veronese. He's born in 1528. Um, he's very, unlike uh, Tintoretto, who's into these more simple kind of lines and looking at color and kind of soft focus, he's much more into this sharper focus and this idea of pageantry. He likes to make these very grand compositions that have this sort of theatrical quality to them. And you can see he does a little more of a, like a sharp focus. So he uses light in an interesting way. He uses color in an interesting way, but it kind of looks a little more like Michelangelo than Leonardo, right? Okay, so both uh, Veronese and uh, Tintoretto were commissioned to decorate the Doge Palace of uh, Venice. Um, so that's like the, the leader of Venice, essentially. Uh, this is Veronese's painting um, for the ceiling. So this is interesting. Instead of doing frescoes for ceiling art, he would do these massive paintings on canvas and then uh, set them in frames and suspend those from the ceiling. So this was painted to be installed in the ceiling and viewed from below. Um, one of the interesting things about it is um, he creates this kind of 45 degree angle within the composition to make it look um, more illusionistic and more engaging with people viewing it from below. And that's a technique that he kind of developed, that idea of manipulating perspective within the painting so that it makes it more illusion illusionistic for the um, person viewing it from below. So that is one of the things he is known for. Um, and there are many other painters from this period that are very successful and interesting. And we will look forward to hearing about what you discover in your discussion post. So that is it for this one. Thank you.